Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena. We arrived here in Brest a few days ago after a very pleasant overnight sail from Helford in the UK. Our plan is to stay here for a little bit. We need to wait for some packages to show up. We want to have a chance to check out the city. And also, of course, we need to keep an eye on the orca situation. My name is Mess. This is my wife, Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun-packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021 we started cruising full time. Now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. The orca situation, I think I mentioned it in last week's video, is still very much going on. There is still orcas out in the middle of the Bay of Biscay with a hankering for sailboat rudders. Over the last few days I've read about yet more orca interactions or attacks directly south or west of Brest along the continental shelf, so out here in the middle of the Bay of Biscay. We're in no particular rush to get to Spain or Portugal, so I think what we'll do is to do a couple of jumps down the French coast before then making the jump to Spain. Just so we can steer clear of this area out here where the majority of the interactions seem to be happening right now. Like I said, we're gonna be here in Brest for a little bit to check out the city, but also to wait for some packages. And while we're waiting for those packages, I might as well go ahead and get another couple of projects checked off the to-do list. One of those projects is to install a shower out in the cockpit to rinse off ourselves after having gone in the water, but also to rinse off scuba gear. And also I would like to add some more ventilation to our head, but uh, let's start with the shower out in the cockpit. While we were still on the Helford River, I got a chance to don my trusty old scuba gear and scrub the bottom of the hull. And also while we were there, my friend Mark came there and he gave me a beginner's lesson on his amazing e-foiling board, which was a ton of fun. And all of that reminded me of how much I love being in the water, but it also made me realize that we need some way of rinsing off water activity gear out in the cockpit. Of course, it's also going to be really nice for Ava and I to be able to rinse off out in the cockpit after having gone for a swim. Right now we're putting down towels here inside the boat to not drip salt water everywhere and it's, it's a little bit of a mess. It'll be much easier to just rinse off out in the cockpit. We already have pressurized hot and cold water here aboard Athena, so adding a shower out in the cockpit should be very easy with one of these kits here. Now I made the suggestion to Ava that perhaps we only needed cold water for rinsing off out in the cockpit seeing as we would probably only use it in warm climates. She was having none of that. So I picked up this version here which has both the sprayer nozzle thingy but also a little mixer so you can have hot or cold water. In our case our water heater is right next to where I want to install the shower doohickey. So this should be a fairly straightforward project. I think I've got everything I need here. We've got some hoses, we've got some tees to tee into our existing pressurized water, some hose clamps, and of course the shiny box itself. When I say shiny box, I do mean shiny, shiny box. I had this out earlier and as you might be able to see, I've already gotten some fingerprints on it. All this box contains is the mixing valve thingy and a hole for holding the little sprayer nozzle that I'm sure is down here somewhere. This is with the spray nozzle in place and uh, as you can see it just pokes out the back here and then there's the connection to the mixing doodad over here. Now a little bit disappointing, there were absolutely no instructions included with this so I don't know which one of these holes is hot, cold or mixed, I'm just gonna have to guess. And also something else that seems to be lacking from this product is a cutout template. At first glance I mean this seems like a perfectly nice product but if they had just gone the extra centimeter and had included a cutout template, that would have made my life a lot easier because this is an oval hole and the tolerances here on the flange for the mounting holes are somewhat tight. So having a cutout template would have made this a lot easier, but uh, now I'll have to make my own. Using a little bit of tape, I should be able to somewhat accurately capture the shape of the shower doohickey hole. Having covered all of the flange in tape, I very carefully lifted the tape making sure not to stretch it as that would warp the shape. 
then it was a simple matter of transferring the tape onto a piece of cardboard and cutting out the middle. The end result was a nice snug fitting template for the hole. After double and triple checking to make sure there was room inside of the cockpit combing for the back of the shower doohickey, I finally cut the hole with a jigsaw and only had to make a few minor adjustments for it to be a good fit. To solve the mystery of what connection does what on the mixing valve, all I did was blow air into it, having it turned all the way to cold, and then switched it all the way to hot and repeated the experiment. I'm going to use four of these little screws here to secure the shower doohickey in the cockpit combing, but using regular screws like this in solid fiberglass can often be a right pain in the behind. If you don't pre-drill a hole that's big enough, especially with thinner diameter screws, there is a very high likelihood that the stupid thing is going to snap and then you're going to be stuck with half a screw in a hole, which is, well, just a real pain in the behind. So what I usually do is I take my calipers and I measure the inner part of the screw, which in this case is three and a half millimeters. So I'd round that up to four and just make sure that that is not bigger than the actual screw. Since I started using that little rule of thumb a few years back, I have not had a single stainless screw snap on me. So uh, <coughs> yeah, fingers crossed we won't start today. Once I secure the shower doodad in place in the cockpit combing, I won't be able to access any of these connections anymore. So I want to make all of those before I screw the thing into the cockpit combing and just make sure that they don't leak. I did myself the small favor of turning off the water heater yesterday, so I should be able to cut the hose with the hot water without getting third degree burns. I've made all of the connections and I'm pleased to report that there are no leaks in any of uh, my connections, but uh, there is another leak. In our case, I can simply just turn the water off on the mixer and this won't leak. But yeah, I'm pretty sure this is not supposed to leak like that. After having opened up the sprayer doodad here, I'm pretty sure we've got a culprit there. There's some metal shaving sitting on this thing which I think is supposed to act as a seal so if we just remove those well maybe it won't leak anymore haha <laughs> sweet sweet victory we are now 100% leak free tada one installed shower doohickey I'm gonna go ahead and call this a great big success. As a little bit of an unexpected bonus, I have realized that the shower hose thingy is actually long enough that I can use the shower thing for cleaning the solar panels. That's a nice added bonus. That is one project done, and we just have one more to go, and that is to add a bit of extra ventilation to the head. We already have a little vent up there that's hooked up to an electric blower that exhausts hot humid air from the shower into the cockpit. That fan is lovingly nicknamed the poop extractor, but uh, there's been complaints from the female portion of the crew about an intermittent poopy smell out in the cockpit. And also the poop extractor is a little bit on the loud side. It's very effective, but a little bit loud. Hopefully this guy will provide a little bit of continuous and also silent ventilation outside of the cockpit. Ideally, I would have liked to install a hatch there, but there's just not quite enough room. Even if we go with the smallest hatches I could find, it's very, very tight. I had an older version of a fan like this aboard Opelix, and uh, in the dark Danish winters, the fan would stop turning. There just wasn't enough sunlight to keep it running. But in the summers, it seemed to work pretty well. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed for this one. This thing is a lot bigger than I remembered, to be honest. It's pretty massive. But uh, the plan is to install this in such a way that if we ever find a hatch that's small enough and we don't like how this is working, well, then we can just enlarge the hole and install a hatch. But uh, yeah, let's uh, go ahead and figure out where to put this. We've got the separation between the head and the shower somewhere right around here, so we can't go further aft than that. So if we put the fan somewhere like here, yeah, I think that will work nicely and the fan should be clear of the main sheet. 
I cut the hole in the cabin top and got the fan installed. I think it looks pretty neat on the outside of the boat. And included with the fan was this little trim ring here for the inside hole. So yeah, it also looks pretty neat on the inside. The fan is not on yet, but I can already feel air blowing in through here. So that's certainly a good sign. On the fan, there are two switches. There's one for a little LED light, and then there's one for turning the fan on or off. There's a feature on here that my old fan didn't have, and that's the fact that you can switch the direction by just switching this little switch. The fan is not particularly loud, and with it on, there is definitely a good amount of air flowing through there. So yeah, I guess time will tell if we keep the fan or if I install a smaller hatch there at some point. Having a bit of air circulation in the head, even when it's raining, is really nice. And we couldn't really do that with a hatch, so maybe the fan is a better option. But yeah, we'll uh, see. We're still waiting for a couple more packages to show up. Chief amongst those, our new Starlink internet connection. We've already gotten a couple of the smaller boxes. But of course, we haven't gotten the actual dish yet, so the most important of the packages. But uh, yeah, it should get here in a few days. I think tomorrow we'll head out and uh, check out Brest. It's gonna be a really nice day here weather-wise, so we thought we would take a little stroll around Brest. Yeah, we've already been to the center of Brest, and I think most of Brest got pretty heavily bombed during the Second World War, so there's not a lot of old quaint stuff left, but uh, Ava's found a few stops for us today. If it's old, I'll find it. Athena's tied up down here. We've walked along this. Now we're gonna get off of the marina and head towards town. The marina here in Brest is really big. We're decked down here and the marina office is way down there. There's some showers there, but luckily there are some showers down here too, close to the boat, which is nice. But the Sherberg Marina was huge too. I guess France just has really big marinas. Mads is definitely the animal whisperer in this relationship. He's always finding animal friends in all the marinas we go to. And Ava does not like them. <laughs> I'm not touching a wild animal. As we all know, most wild animals wear a collar. So yes, obviously that cat was totally wild. <laughs> That is our first stop, actually. It is the U.S. Naval Monument. I thought it was gonna be really small, but we were just walking up and I was like, oh my God, there it is. It's this huge tower. So let's go check it out. First, we have to go up the Staircase of Doom. It seems like on a long one day passage from the UK, our legs have already atrophied. This is pure agony. We just had to cross this road and since being in the UK, I have no idea which way cars are coming from. I'm just like, every time I cross the road, I have to look both ways. It just, it feels very chaotic. More stairs. <sighs> the monument's just on the other side of this path. And I'm telling you, that's what France is really good at. Beautiful tree-lined paths. Brest Harbor was a pretty significant base for the U.S. Navy during World War I. So this monument was put up to honor the U.S. Navy. But then in World War II, it was knocked down by the Germans. And then it was rebuilt in 1958 to, again, commemorate the work that the U.S. did here during the Second World War. Well, during both World Wars. Our next stop is a short walk that way. That is Chateau de Brest. I'm sure I am butchering that, but uh, that's what we're going to stick with. On our walk to the next stop, we're going to enjoy a traditional French breakfast of a uh, Nature Valley crunchy Canadian maple syrup bar, which is incredibly dry and uh, we haven't brought any water. We walk from the monument over there all the way along the tree line to the castle. And there is so much to say about this castle because it is so old. There is evidence that fortifications has been built on this site since before the Roman era. And then around the 10th century, it got a big dream home makeover, but that would not be its last. 
Over the next four centuries, the castle will be torn down and rebuilt to what you see today. Over the course of its history, it will be the center of drama, including family rivalries, a pawn and the never ending wars against Spain and England, and the stage for many sieges, including its very last by the Germans during World War II. After World War II, there was a big reconstruction project, and now the castle holds the National Maritime Museum, so you can peruse some French naval history. Right behind me is Tanguay Tower. I'm probably butchering that, but it is one of the last remaining medieval structures because, like we said before, a lot of things were destroyed during the war but they think that this tower was built around the 14th century. But today it's really cool. Inside there are a bunch of dioramas created by an artist and the dioramas depict different parts of history in Brest. Like we said before, most of Brest was destroyed from bombings during World War II, but this is Rue St. Malo, and it is one of the last remaining almost untouched blocks in Brest, and it dates all the way back to medieval times. I'm really glad we end up coming here. It's a little kooky. There's tons of art and lots of things hidden in like every nook and cranny, especially this little thing. There's like a little garden back here. I really love it here. I read online that Rue St. Malo was home to sailors, shipbuilders, and loose women. I don't know how true that is, but it's kind of cool. But in 1989, a group was formed called Viva La Rue, and they formed to stop the demolition of Rue St. Malo. A little doorway. A pot and a nook. I can't take it. This place is awesome. Random wood carvings in a stone doorway. I love it. I love it. I can't take it. Even the toilet is disgustingly beautiful. We took this cable car thingy here behind me to get back to the center of town. So now we've made kind of a big loop. Now the cable car is the easiest way to get back to the center of town. And it's also a really great view from up there of both the castle and well, the entire area we've just walked. For the purposes of the video, it would have been really great if we came across a little patisserie where we could have gotten baguettes with ham and cheese. That seems very French, at least to me. We did come across a patisserie, but all they had were these wraps, which Ava says are delicious, so that's okay. I'm so sorry about the audio quality and that little walking tour of Brest. We're trying out this new hot shoe mounty mic thingy here from Sony, and I'd accidentally left this filter here on the back in noise canceling mode, and I think that is what messed up the audio, so we won't do that again. We're still waiting for our Starlink dish to show up, but the track and trace information is telling us that it's finally made it to France. So uh, any day now. I hope I can install that next week and uh, I'm gonna do a somewhat temporary install out on the solar arch. It's not gonna be perfect because there's gonna be a little bit of shading on the solar panels, but I think that's the best I can do for now. But hopefully next week we can get that installed and all configured and have super nice fast internet. And also next week, late next week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, something like that, it looks like we'll have a weather window to continue jumping south along the coast of France. And on that hopeful note, we'll end this week's video here. We hope to see all of you guys back here aboard Athena next week for yet more DIY fun with some fast internet and maybe perhaps a little bit of sailing. Yep, hopefully we can start chugging along. Yep. That would be good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we hope to see all you guys back here aboard Athena. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See, see you. you.